Thank you, Rosio. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope after the technical debate and the, the interesting discussion of data in your business models, there's uh, still some juice left in the in the tank. Um, I promise there will be no technicalities involved for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. As uh, Rocio said, my uh, name is Bruno de la Pierre. Um, I'm the founder of Haponomy. You probably figured out that uh, this is happiness and economy squeezed into a single word. And we're indeed a nonprofit organization which uh, develop mainly business and economics driven solutions to increase the quality of our lives and the sustainability of our planet. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, the organizing team for the invitation and um, share with you that I always feel a bit uh, awkward when I'm asked to give a so-called uh, inspirational talk, um, because in the end today, I uh, just want to share my perspective on entrepreneurship uh, and how entrepreneurs can be a force to drive a more sustainable future, building on the waves of my life and uh, the things that I have learned from it uh, up to now. Uh, let me take you... Uh, to my uh, living room. It was uh, a rainy day somewhere in the end of uh, January 2014. I was standing in front of the mirror gazing at myself. I uh, had just hit a wall in life. I uh, decided to close down the company I started from scratch uh, alone many years ago. It was an uh, end point of eight years of hard work and many seemingly insurmountable obstacles. What you need to know is that eight years earlier, so just about six months after I started my company, which was a, a digital agency, my uh, mother, who had been having cancer on and off for many years, passed away. Five months later, my father died as well, all of a sudden. And there I was, age 26, orphaned with my startup, my parents' restaurant, a, a business I knew literally nothing about, uh, and above all, my grief to manage. I don't know about you, but uh, here in Belgium, um, that's a place uh, in the world where men are not real men when they take time to process and express their emotions. So after closing down the restaurant, I didn't take time to handle my sorrow and I just wanted to frantically grow my company, looking to open up an office in London, looking for investors. I wanted to grow like there was no tomorrow, basically the typical, uh, let's say, Silicon Valley way of life, I suppose. In hindsight, I didn't want to grow because of joy of what I did, but because of the pain I had inside me, desperately trying to run away from myself. But of course, as you know, it's uh, really hard to run away from yourself all the time. So six years down the road, um, with a team of about 20 people to manage, I was at the end of my rope. For years, I had run away from the grief of the loss of my parents, and our agency was promoting yet another product online, something which uh, didn't offer any meaning anymore. And I wanted to focus on something more meaningful. So that's why uh, a year earlier I had uh, started transferring the day to day management of the company to a management team. At first things went well, but soon things went south as I had chosen great people for the wrong role. I had failed to secure the future of the business in which I had put so much energy. My journey as an entrepreneur had proven to be unsustainable. I had to start over one month before the birth of my daughter. What I learned from that episode is that as with COVID, life deals you with situations which you cannot foresee, how much you plan or prepare. Life also deals you with the cards you can handle. So if you'd be in a bad place right now, don't despair. Life can get better if you'd wanted to. So there I was standing in the living room, looked at the tears on my face in the mirror, and asked myself what I would want my daughter to think of me when she was a grown-up woman and I would be an old man. What would she think of me, of my actions, of the person I would ha have become? And it's, um, it's a question I'd like to ask you today as well. You uh, all are ready to embark on the journey as an innovator or a high-tech entrepreneur contributing to solving one of humanity's biggest problems up to now. But above all, what do you want to see in the mirror when you're old and all is said and done? To me, in that moment, I decided the life I wanted to live was a life where I could deploy the knowledge and talents I had to make her life, the one of my daughter and those of her unborn children better, not yet knowing how, but feeling it was my only path forward, even though I did not know where it would bring me. I took heart from people like uh, Chuck Feeney, 
chances are you never heard of him. Uh, Chuck is an entrepreneur who earned $8 billion, mainly by managing duty-free shops in airports. Obviously, that's nothing spectacular, but Chuck had one aspiration after making his fortune, and it was leaving the planet with zero dollars left on his bank account. To do so, he uh, chose to spend his money on universities in the US and Ireland, but also helped modernize the Vietnamese healthcare system. Another guy I really admire is Dan Price. Maybe that's a person who is more familiar in startup land. He's the founder of a credit card processing company who raised the minimum salary for all of his employees to $70,000 and loaned, uh, lowered his um, own uh, wage from uh, 1.1 million to $70,000 as well. So quite inspiring examples. But of course, the question that was still staring back to me or at me in the mirror was a difficult one, where to begin? And at first sight, it may be a question you share as the challenges we face today seem daunting, as the systems we have created do not serve our well-being anymore. Our planet is uh, increasingly, increasingly in trouble. Entire ecosystems are crumbling. The economists calculated the ecological cost of our current way of living is a staggering amount of 7 trillion euros. Apart from the ecological challenges, also insecurity and fair inequality, both are on the rise again, leading us into a burnout pandemic and a society where more and more youngsters consciously choose to drop out of society, basically giving up, not even trying. According to the OECD, mental health problems in the EU, 600 billion euros. Of course, those are just numbers and something that may seem far away, but uh, more recently I had a drink with a friend of mine and uh, she told me she was struggling with climate depression. At first I didn't really get what she meant, but then it dawned that um, it was basically the constant negative news we constantly hear had beaten her to the ground. So um, what do you think? Should we, uh, should we just give up? Oh, well, personally, I think COVID has given us the answer. Who would have thought a couple of years ago, humanity would have come together in ways we have never done before. We are uh, working together. You're the perfect examples of this. Transcending differences in color, age, religion, all to support our collective well-being and health. I think COVID-19 has been an invitation to stand jointly and has shown the potential of people working together as a force of good. Of course, this is all nice, but again, where to begin? On my end, first, I uh, wanted to understand why we failed uh, up to now to do something so seemingly obvious. Why haven't we been able to create a more uh, sustainable way of living? What does that even mean, sustainable, right? It's a, it's a word used and abused so many times by well-meaning people and greenwashing companies alike. It, uh, it's become an empty container. I personally took heart from the definition of the Brundtland Commission of the United Nations, which in the 1980s dubbed sustainable development as a fulfillment of needs of the people of the present without negatively impacting the needs of future generations. To me, that was a description I could work from. But then the question, of course, arose, what are those needs? It's a question I would like to extend to you as well. What do you need? It was a question to me which submerged me in all types of science, ranging from positive psychology to endocrinology to figure that out. And I learned how our emotions steer our choices and behavior, but also how our current economic system creates stress with people, causing harm to our health, to our relations and to our planet, but also how systems serve us until they don't. We are currently struggling with a system built on the belief that companies are good as long as they do nothing illegal. A system which has been useful for quite a long time, propelling our uh, output efficiently, enabling us to enjoy all the niceties in life, like uh, iPhones, adventurous holidays on the other side of the planet, or uh, just a roof over our head and food in our mouths. So let's be gentle to ourselves and the, the system we created, not running away from the change of it, of course, but as with all the systems we have created, we can change them if we want to. And there's plenty of things, large and small, which you can do. And that's why a couple of years ago, I wrote an economic cookbook, how to transform our businesses and our economy with 35 recipes in it. 
things seemingly easy, such as <clears throat> being transparent, how much everybody earns in your company, just to increase the trust between people and avoid that money negatively impacts that. Or making sure that there's socially or ecologically driven criteria in executive bonus systems. Those are quite easy, I think, to uh, to capture. But um, some things are maybe more difficult. For instance, um, let me ask you, would you think that uh, it's okay to tax companies uh, based on the number of robots that are used in the company? Or do you think it's even possible that we can just cancel debt for people in trouble? These challenges are not necessarily uh, technical in nature, but much more between our ears. What do we think is possible? Anyway, the book, um, that would be already something that I could show my daughter when she was uh, older and uh, where I could tell her that uh, this is what daddy did, or at least to try to make the world a bit of a better place. It was also a starting point of my journey and brought me to a point where I fondly believe we can transform our businesses and our economy for the better. Um, in our organization, we are currently working on a solution to uh, structure companies in a way so it get rid gets rid of greenwashing once and for all. Uh, we're also piloting an internally developed sustainable money system. It doesn't have any inflation in it like uh, we're currently experiencing now. We're uh, piloting that system in a Belgian city as we speak. There's uh, 100 people who receive a guaranteed income in the complementary city currency next to the euro and people can decide which social and ecologically driven initiative in their city they want to support with their taxes by doing so we stimulate both the local economy and above all i think we strengthen the local community so if your goal is to increase a more sustainable way of living know you're not alone Today, more and more people are standing up to change the systems that do not serve us anymore. And the sustainable era is here. It is here to stay. The examples are everywhere. And let me give you a couple just to, to show you where we're at. People like Kate Rayworth, maybe you know her, she's a British scholar, is advocating the donut economy. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a, a model to live within our planetary boundaries and build sustainable cities. Cities like Brussels and Amsterdam are already applying this way of thinking to redesign their policies and in effect change their local economies and societies. You may also have heard of B Corp, um, a, cert uh, a certification for sustainability that is um, awarded to companies to ensure that they have sound social and ecological policies in place. One of its latest members is an unexpected one, maybe, because it's Nestlé, the largest global food conglomerate. Showing big organizations are not necessarily the enemy, but can be an ally in sustainable change. As entrepreneurs like yourselves, you can also make a quite sustainable difference every day. Many have done before, and um, I'll give you three, three short examples. The first one, being a Belgian, touches my heart a bit because it's a Dutch company. It's a, a Dutch chocolate company um, called Tony Chocolonely. Maybe uh, you know their story. And apart from making chocolate, of course, um, they ensure that in the process of making chocolate, um, there's no slavery involved uh, in, in the entire value chain. So quite an achievement. Patagonia, that's a well-known brand. Um, their mission is not to make outdoor gear but it's to protect nature and therefore they use their profits to fund small grassroots activist groups who work to protect our planet. Closer to here in Belgium, you have a single entrepreneur who has been educating street children in remote rural areas using a mobile school. And he uses those insights in, their, in his company called Streetwise, which offers leadership trainings to large multinational company managers. These examples show that a team, small or big, even single founder entrepreneurs can be a shaper of a sustainable future as well. Of course, um, I don't think we can get complacent and forget there's still a lot of people who think sustainability is just a, a fad, uh, something that will just go away. So it's up to those uh, uh, who hold the torch to keep the faith and move forward. And that's why I want to share five principles with you which can help you do so. I hope it can be a bit of a North Star as aspiring uh, entrepreneurs for good. The first one is um, keep your eye on the prize. Entrepreneurship is, is about the value you create, reducing pain and increasing joy for your fellow human beings. You may be deeply immersed in medical data sets on COVID or focusing on earning money, but don't forget these are just a means to an end. 
if we want humanity to thrive, we need to increase our focus on what matters. In your case, I suppose towards prevention of COVID if possible, and for those people who are infected, ensuring a better quality of life. A second one, you don't need to burn yourself to light the world. Um, there's many sustainability driven entrepreneurs who forget the most important stakeholder of them all being themselves. If we want to make humanity thrive, start with yourself, stay in tune with how you feel about things and reflect. To quote uh, Bruno Mars, stop, wait a minute. The third rule for me, and it's a difficult one, is try to stay Zen in a system that breeds insecurity. What I would personally like that everyone knows is that our current system in which we live is setting us up for failure. If we want to thrive, we need to alter the systems we live in. We need to change the systems, ensure that they nurture us, embrace our insecurities. We need the systems who value real human connection, not digital fake ones. We need systems that help us grow as individuals, respect our planet and provide meaning in our lives. Today, it's not the case and it's up to you to figure out how to thrive yourself in an imperfect world. The fourth one is a very important one and it's an obvious one, but it's often forgotten. Build a sustainable organization yourself. Um, don't make the mistake of thinking that the product is the company. It is something I personally struggled with and where I have seen many knowledge driven entrepreneurs making the mistake thinking that their solution is their business. You will need many talents and many people to bring your solution to the world. And the most important for you is not to build a solution, but to bring on board the right people who are supported by the right tools and processes with meaningful numbers that steer your organization's direction. And last but not least, five, use profit for good. Many sustainability driven entrepreneurs believe profit and value. Well, hmm, it's a bit of a tricky combination. Uh, you can focus on profits, looking to cut costs everywhere you can, think Jeff Bezos style, or you can be someone who cares about value and feels money is in your way. Neither are sustainable. So focus on value, but don't be afraid to accept the money that returns to you. And when you have it, use it to be a force for good. It's my hope that these, uh, these five golden rules, or at least my five golden rules will help you a bit become a truly successful, sustainably driven entrepreneur and that we can jointly uh, defeat uh, COVID. Um, and as a final thought, maybe before, uh, before lunch, let me leave you with this. Uh, no matter which path you, you follow, whether it's an entrepreneur or an innovator or something entirely different, don't uh, forget about the mirror. Think, uh, love and do. Those are my three ingredients to make sure the mirror smiles back at me. And I sincerely hope you will find your ingredients as well. All the best with your endeavors and uh, let's jointly kill COVID. Thanks. Bravo. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, that was uh, truly inspiring. I, I would like to start with a question if the, if the audience allow me. Um, um, we have before uh, another talk about, uh, from Avin, which is a doctor and have also the philosophy of uh, sustainable uh, entrepreneurship. And of course, he's a doctor, so for him, the key was to do no harm. That's why it was important to have a sustainable business uh, model. Uh, but I wonder, because of course, even though you have explained how how big company also embrace some somehow sustainability model, uh, if there is any key any button that we can push to make that be a sustainability, I mean to, to be able to to see where the sustainability is also a win win for for everyone, also for the business itself, uh, since it's seen for many companies. The, the, the greedy, uh, the, uh, it is what is made them to be able to, to have a big companies and, and move in that way. Uh, mm -hmm. So what is your opinion in, in how we can ma make this happen for everyone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, a clear question and a clear problem. Um, I think there's two, two sides to the discussion. The first one is obviously what do the companies create and how do they do that, right? 
Um, are they exploiting natural resources in an unsustainable way? Of course, that's that's harming, right? So that's that's obvious. That's not a good idea, and that needs to change. A lot of companies uh, are are doing that already, working towards circularity uh, um, step by step. Of course, it can go quicker, and it, uh, it it should go quicker at least. So that's one one side of the story. Of course, the second one is really a, a financial uh, thing, where um, my perspective is that the value that the companies create have to go to all the the stakeholders involved and that's not just the shareholders who invest money and the top management um, that gets some bonuses uh, from time to time it also needs to go to society as a whole um, at least that's my perspective and <laughs> i told you uh, very briefly that we're working on a, a company model to abolish greenwashing it's it's actually exactly that because what how it works is that companies decide on a on a legal level on in their statutes that they are going to um, let's say use their profits differently and allocate percentages of their profits towards social and ecological initiatives, which means that you transform the entire story from sustainability into from let's say one line in an Excel. I have a yearly budget of one hundred thousand, and then we'll make a lot of communication to it to a financial change where they will have to allocate uh, profits and and money structurally. Let's say 20% of the operational profits go to a, no, a non-profit um, planting trees uh, in Madagascar or, or solving uh, solving poverty in this in their in their home city. Then, of course, that's that it's, it's, I think in English they say put your money where your mouth is. I think that's the second uh, the second part of uh, the so-called solution, but of course, and I don't know if I was able to convey that um, all organizations are still operating in a larger system, which does yeah, is, is not inherently stable. Um, so it's it's difficult, of course. So we need to work on both uh, on both levels. I think does that make sense, Rocio? <laughs> it does make sense. It does make sense. I just I just uh, wish to to be able to spin up that so the this sustainable era really really. Mm -hmm. start by the time that my kids are are grown up mm -hmm. uh, because so far i don't i don't see that um i mean mm -hmm. of course there is there is um um there is some companies and they're embracing even big companies but i the, the models that the, the the globalization rise is is not yet in that point i mean i don't mm -hmm. But that's that's the thing, and that's the question on what do you need? Remember when like sustainable, what do you need? As long as people think, I don't know what, I'm, I'm, I don't have anything against Nestle to be clear, but if they think that uh, Chocos or whatever, uh, is that from Nestle? I don't know. Um, if they want the uh, kind of cereals or, or yogurts, um, yeah, they will buy it and then, then yeah, it will be produced, of course. So one thing is that I think every person, if they are more conscious what they want and use the, the buying power that they have to make conscious decisions there, that will also help. And I'm more hopeful. Um, I think you probably noticed uh, I'm a more, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still a believer in a positive future. Yeah. <laughs> because if you, if you look at the, the speed of change, it's really accelerating uh, immensely. Um, I don't know if you remember, like we're now 20 years down the line, but we started with the Millennium Goals. So that was the first time on a global level there was some sustainability uh, sustainability framework. Now we're at the SDGs. There's still a lot to be told about the SDGs, which is wrong and geopolitically. There's well, that's for another talk, maybe, but um, but it's it's much further down the line. And in 2030 there will be new ones. So if if we all work together, uh, I believe there's a, a lot to be done. And one more point is that I do believe that startups, since they're still agile and they don't have that much structure yet, they can be the, um, let's say, the, the examples of how it can be done. So um, apply those sustainability principles in a day-to-day -day management basis, dare to uh, allocate your profits structurally to something else than just your own pockets and, and um, show how it's done. I think that's uh, the best way forward. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I think this kind of thing happen more in startups, the small companies. Uh, the, the the this is why it's my concern and how to make this happen and for big companies for that that so we can see really a change mm -hmm. in the world. Um, so I don't want to monopolize. I don't know if anyone else have a question for for Bruno. 
or want to make any comment in the subject. Uh, okay, and um, yes, we have a we have a quiet audience today. I I this is this is how it is. So so in any case, we have reached the time where I I say that I were going to to hold you. Uh, and I am really thankful for you to come in today and to all the solution to and get the, the event and the participation and of course and our technical uh, teams for for me the most of the time. Um, and I I wish you the best. Thank you, Rosie, and thank you all uh, for uh, yeah, for uh, taking the time to that I could share your my my story and my perspective. Um, I wish you all the best with all the technical discussions you still have on your plate, uh, <laughs> scaling dimensions and the uh, SaaS models and those kind of things. But uh, I hope I was able to, uh, let's say, open up a bit the the brains and what we're doing. And uh, if we work jointly, uh, that's the best we can do, I think. Enjoy the. Well, in the my, in in the, in it is true that actually technology can be can be easy can be easier to make it as a sustainable uh, world. And I know that because it is. Yes, it, there is not there is not a product that you can change and you can have slavery. And so I mean, we can have we can yeah, we can have these two things together to get the best. And let's have still oh. chocolate as a Belgian, right? Yes, <laughs> I love chocolate. Yes, no Dutch chocolate, Belgian chocolate. <laughs> no, anyways, yes. take Thank care. Thank you very much. In any